So um, if you don't have it already, go ahead and from this plotting and programming with Python software carpentry license, download the Python novice gapminder data. That's what we're going to be using today. Um, it doesn't really matter where you download it to. Um, the This zip archive, archive contains a folder full of data. So wherever you download it to, you'll just wind up unzipping it there. So in this case, I downloaded it to my documents, and then I'll just extract here. And the folder is just called data, and it just contains um, a variety of, of CSV files or comma-separated variable files. So, okay, uh, let's see. So um, that's done. Now I need to install NumPy. Um, I Okay, good. Okay. And then um, go ahead and open Jupyter Lab. And uh, oops, I want. Okay, so um, so last time we spent quite a bit of time talking about um, the the Anaconda and then the Jupiter and um, Jupiter Lab environment, um, and I I spent quite a bit of extra time talking about um, some of the, the benefits and then some of the drawbacks of using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and so a lot of times, especially for those of you that are new to, to Jupyter Notebooks in particular or, or programming in notebooks in general, um, you know, when you do encounter errors and you just can't sort of figure out why it is, often it is the result of some of those things that we covered on Tuesday, right? This idea that you know, I, I'm running a cell and I haven't yet, I updated I updated a constant somewhere in a cell book before, but I didn't run that cell and all of the cells after it to make sure everything was up to date. Okay, so um, as we go through this and as you start to get stuck with things, that's what's one thing to kind of check immediately. Okay, so um, go ahead and create a new notebook. Um, and then, uh, Actually, um, what I want to do is go into documents. Make sure that you create this new notebook um, in the folder where that uh, Gapminder data set is. Um, if you want, you can uh, go ahead and rename this notebook. So we can call this something like um, Intro to Python. Okay. And where, where we'll be starting off today is this uh, variables and assign, assignment um, portion of the lesson. So um, if you could open that, um, we covered a lot of this uh, last time, um, but go ahead and read through. Oh, we, we read, read through a bunch of this at the end of class. So. Um, Where did we read through Python is case sensitive? Is that where we read through approximately? 
You read it all? Who read it all? Anybody? Okay, so a few of you. Okay. The um this is just some background information on 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 variables, right? And the fact that it's important to declare variables before we use them. Stuff that a lot of you already know if you're a MATLAB user, if you're an R user, right? You appreciate these things that you can't say print X if X is not yet declared. Okay. Um, one thing that's um, a, a minor topic here is this idea of using using meaningful variable names. Um, and I I can't underscore kind of how important this becomes later on, and and that it's not a it's not necessarily a straightforward topic. Okay. So um, so you know. The temptation is right, and often the case is, um, for instance, that um, in in Python and in other programming languages, right, the temptation is to use kind of dummy variable names like x or y or z, right, um, and sometimes those can have um, meaningful connotations associated with them, right? X and y are clearly spatial coordinates. Um, and, and maybe Z is something like height or altitude or elevation, um, but it it becomes less clear when you have variables that are like F or G or F underscore G. Um, and so oftentimes, um, especially if you're, again, writing the code so that you are able to read it in the future or other people that come after you are able to read it, it's really important to kind of use meaningful names, right? Use meaningful um, descriptions for variables. So an example of this is if you are writing a code that is simulating, um, you know, if you're writing an open channel flow routine, right? Um, and one of the variables that you're going to be setting is the, the roughness or the Manning's N, right? You could call that variable N, that's a perfectly legitimate variable in Python, okay? Um, it's also how it's shown in textbooks, right? When you are shown the Manning's equation, that's V equals one over N, blah, 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 right? It's not particularly meaningful in a, in a chunk of Python code, unless whoever is coming to that knows that that is going to be um, a open channel flow simulation, right? So, a more very a more uh, meaningful variable name might be what? Thoughts? Roughness, right? So that's good, right? Others? Manning's N, Manning N, right? Manning underscore N, N underscore Manning, right? All of those are, are perfectly fine, right? And they do add that sort of additional layer of just description to what the variable is, okay? Um, it makes for the variables a little bit longer. So when you're writing out your equations, you know, you, the, the actual code will look a little bit longer, but that's okay. Right, and there's actually ways that we can break our equations across multiple lines. I'll show you how to do that in a bit. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Is there anything else down here I want to cover? Um, I don't think so. So we'll go ahead and proceed to built-in functions and or data types and type conventions. Okay. Um, so let's read down to um, uh, read down to this automatic type conversion right here. And then we'll stop here and talk about this, okay? So. And then while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get sticky notes so that we can all have them again. Okay.
I got blue and orange. Blue and orange. So put up your blue flag when you're done. If you have them, you can keep them, but pass them on if you don't. Okay. So I'm going to go back here um, and where was I? I was in data types and conversion. Okay, so um, if you're new to programming, this portion of the les lesson is, is actually um, somewhat important and uh, for those of us that learned a lower level programming language to start something like C or Fortran or Java, you probably have already covered this. Um, and this is actually like some pretty fundamental stuff. And, and um, what, uh, what Python does drives my colleagues in computer science absolutely nuts, right? Um, and and there's there's reasons there's reasons why Python Python does it this way. There are also good reasons to not do it the way that Python does it. Okay, so just to demonstrate, if I go back to my um, the Jupyter notebook that I had open, what was it? No. So. And I assign some variable a equal to three, three point four, and I assign some other variable b equal to four, and I compute a plus b. What do I expect from this? What is mathematically what is this number? Seven point four. Okay. And indeed, that's what Python returns. In terms of data types, though, okay, um, what is B? B is an integer, right? What is A? A is a float, right? Or a double or whatever, right? 
Um, so, right in in math, in like elementary math, it's whole numbers versus decimals, right? So you can think of an integer being a whole number, and um, right a a float um, could be a whole number, but it would have to be like four point zero, right? Um, so strictly speaking, if you did this in another language, if you did this in C, you would get a type error, right? C would say, I can't add an integer to a float, right? Um, Python, by contrast, um, it says, I see that you're trying to add two numbers together. Okay, one of them is a float. Another one is an integer. I am going to save you the embarrassment of pushing an error message to the screen. And I'm just going to convert, right? I'm going to typecast my integer as a float, and then I will add them together. Okay. Now that seems um, that seems like pretty basic, right? And it's one thing if this is one individual number. Okay. Um, the reason why my computer science colleagues hate this, right, is that imagine now that that B was not just a single a scalar, right, a single um, integer number four. Imagine that it's a tensor, right? It's a three by three matrix. It's like the temperature at different points in space and vertical levels in the atmosphere. Right, and it's all an integer. Okay, it's like a sequential, like unique cell number for those individual slices in the atmosphere. And it's like a million of them. Okay. And I want to do some operation with that with a float. I want to multiply that by some number, right? I don't know why I would want to do that, but you could. What the under what Python would do, right, is it would take that big tensor B and convert it from a multi-dimensional tensor that's of type integer. And it would create a, a copy of it in the so-called memory stack that is of type float or type double. And then it would, well, it would keep my B in the stack because I might be doing something else with it. And then it would add or multiply that other tensor that I'm trying to multiply it by. Okay. Now, in doing so, right, the other complication here is that um, to store a double in the memory, right, is some requires something like eight times the amount of memory to store an integer, right? So if I have a, a tensor that has like a million numbers in it, and I need to make a copy of it, but that copy goes from integer to double. I've not only right copied that tensor, I've copied it like and scaled it up in memory like eight times, right? So I now have an object that's eight times the size in, in the memory, okay? And so that's why computer science types don't like, would criticize that, right? They'd say that there's actually sort of more memory efficient ways to do that. Right, you might have a for loop or whatever that individual individually converts each element B to a float before doing some mathematical operation, right? Um, but Python is doing this for us automatically and under the hood. Okay, so um, so the downside of this, however, is that. You know, when it comes to doing really large mathematical operations, Python can get a little bit slow with respect to some other languages that require you to be more careful about how you're dealing with the memory. Okay. So when we're dealing with like actual kind of geophysical data, we can actually slow down the computer when we're having to do this automatic type conversion. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show is that, um, uh, and this is this is also kind of um, 
This is different than in other languages. Um, it's also a little bit weird, but um, will be beneficial to us when it comes time to kind of like managing files, okay? And um, if I have, for instance, um, some variable that's called file base, and it's, um, let's say it's T2M underscore at AVG underscore, okay? And I have this variable, okay? And I have some other variable and I'll call it something like, um, file date, and this one I'll say is something like uh, 2022 0915 underscore 00 Z dot NC. And I'm totally making these up, but they're meaningful, right? So maybe you can start to see where my head is going with this. Okay, if I do something like file equals file base plus file date, and then I print file. Okay. Python is just going to assume that I want to do something called concatenating those strings, right? Um, in other languages, you would have to use a function called like strcat or something like that, right? To, to concatenate, to put my strings together. Okay, based on these two specific names that I provided here, how does this potentially come in handy? Right, so what might this file base T2M underscore average be? So, you know, most of you are not hydrometeorologists or climate scientists, but um, could you take a relatively, could you take an educated guess at what T2M underscore AVG is? Average temperature at two meters above the ground. Average temperature at two meters above the ground. Yep, that's a perfectly good guess, right? Now, what is this file date maybe correspond to? What might that look like? Again, assuming you know you all are not necessarily climate or weather folks, but you could probably give a guess. It's the it's the date, right? This is 2022, September 15th. It's a net CDF file. What does this 0, 0, 0 z mean? What's that, Rachel? What does zero zero z mean? I'll pick on you because I know you know. You should. So z is z is Zulu time, right? Oh, I <laughs> so, so that's zero zero hours, universal time coordinated, right? So this is like zero Greenwich Mean Time. So Met data is always indexed to, right? Because the world doesn't really care about our time zones. So we always use UTC times, okay? So um, the nice thing is, is um, we can just concatenate these using the plus symbol. Where might that come in handy? How might this come in handy in some kind of workflow that we might do? Maybe if I'm working with different files, let's say I'm having a different data with different models. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, assuming that I might want to do this for multiple days or multiple hours or whatever, right? I could just I could just iterate, right? I if I have some way of calling the date and time, I can just create a new when I have a new file. I can just create the rest of that file, smush them together. Right, and then I have my file name, which I can then presumably go and open. Okay, now the trouble is, is that the converse 
doesn't work, right? So if I do file base minus file date, right? It's gonna say unsupported operand types for minus for string, right? And that kind of makes sense. It's one thing to add two strings together. That's just concatenation. If I say subtract this one string from another, that doesn't make a lot of sense, okay? Okay, so let's actually, let's move ahead to this libraries part, okay? Um, again, let's just skim this. Um, the most important thing is on how to get help with a module. Um, but if you remember from last time, when we talked about libraries, what was the analogy that I used again? So this notebook here that I'm going to delete all of these. Okay, so this empty notebook is like what? It's like a warehouse or just an empty shop, right? It's got walls, it's got a roof, a concrete floor, and that's it. The libraries that I use are like what? Like my toolboxes that I'm rolling in. And then my, I used, so we did import, import NumPy as NP, right? And this as NP was just a way of me labeling that toolbox, right? It was taking that painter's tape and a Sharpie ripping off a piece and writing NP and sticking it on my toolbox, okay? Okay, so enough about that. Let's go ahead and start reading and working with some data, okay? Um, what I would like you to do is see if you can't get through um, importing this data file, this gapminder underscore GDP Oceana dot CSV. Right. All you have to do is follow these instructions. Um, so we're importing a new library that's called pandas or pandas. I don't know the correct pronunciation. Um, uh, this is going to be a really helpful module for us, especially when we do time series analysis. Okay, but see if you can't get to this point here. Okay, so. Go ahead and do that. And then put your blue flag up once you're done. Now you might have to go into your Anaconda Explorer and, and add. If you're using your base Anaconda installation, Pandas is installed. If you've created a new environment for this class or for whatever reason, make sure that Pandas is installed, okay? And then if you are in the directory with the files, you do not need to include this folder data. Okay, so you would just start off with Gapminder. Through the this lesson, yeah. I mean, part of how much? How much? How far do you? Uh, oh, just get to where you. If you have read in, if you've read in the data, and you, you print data and you don't get an error, or you, you read the file and you don't get an error, you're good.
Okay. Anybody having, again, put up your orange flag if you're stuck and you can't go any further otherwise. Yeah, so try this first, dude. Like, um, do your import first and then make sure it imports. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, start a whole new notebook. I think somehow, um, I think I'm, I moved this file thing to this folder. Yeah, so that can, that can create issues. So go ahead and um, close the. Okay. All right. Everybody else good? So if it won't find the file, try creating a new. So if you happen to create your notebook outside of the folder and then move it into the folder, that can create some weird issues with how it associates the notebook with where it is located, right? In the metadata, some, sometimes that can be kind of wonky. So try just creating a new notebook with the content. So I think that this is um, a junior lab version issue. So, yeah, you yeah. can always just use the, the scissors like the flat thing and then just copy it. Like that's usually what I do. I got to fix it right now. Did it fix it? Yes. Green, are you good? It's not doing anything. Okay. Okay, can you you need so all you need to add is import from the after the import. Oh yeah. So okay. where are you getting? 
same thing. Um, oh, so all you have to do is put the page in Okay. So and I want to. Um, I I want to sort of uh, bring up a very common, just typographical error that can happen, right? Um, one thing that can happen that's very easy, right? Especially if you're trying to do stuff quickly, is as you're rolling those toolboxes in, we have these kind of standard ways of of referring to them. So num numpy is almost always np, pandas is always almost always pd, right? Um, so if you mistakenly roll in NumPy, tear off that piece of painter's tape and call it PD, okay, Python is going to say, okay, whatever, like, I, I mean, it's not going to say like, hey, I don't know why you're calling NumPy PD, but it's just going to let you do it, okay, so if, you know, if you're doing this, right, if you did this, for instance, and it said, um, you know, I, there's no PD has no function read underscore CSV, that's a good clue that either you haven't imported pandas or you kind of mislabeled it. Okay. Okay. Now, I don't want to belabor too much about um, about this, but what's what's kind of cool about this is I showed you kind of two different ways to display this data, right? One is to just hit data and hit enter. And the other was to do what the lesson did, which is to say print data. What's super kind of nice about this and a, a really good way to think about, um, so, so what Pandas did is it read this comma separated variable file, the CSV file, right? These are the files that most often Many of you are used to reading in Excel, and it's read it into something called a data frame, right? How many R programmers are there out there? So R is all about data frames, right? Everything is a data frame. So, um, so a data frame is is an object, right? So for those of you that have ever heard the term object oriented programming, you're doing it now. Right, you've read this data into an object, right? And and the way that I like to think about this is that I now have a whole spreadsheet in this variable that's just called data, right? And there's a lot of different things that we can do with that. And the lesson sort of takes you through some of the very basic ones, right? Um, well, first of all, we could read in the data slightly differently. I could go back here and say, I actually want to call countries my index column. So I'll call read underscore CSV with index call equal to country. And if you watch what happens here when I read on this cell, it's no longer going to have zero and one. It's going to say country. Australia, New Zealand. Okay. So, and then across my columns are GDP, right? About every five ish years, right? So I have gross domestic product, right? Presumably, this is in something like US dollars with a datum of like 1990 or something like that, right? Um, this is the, the gross domestic product, presumably per capita, so per person in New Zealand and Australia from 1952 all the way up through 2007, okay? So um, displaying these, uh, you can display these differently, right? You can use print and what print will do is just kind of give you like a raw text format, okay? Um, what just writing data in and running this cell will do is kind of format it nicely for you, right? It, we now have kind of this 
um, scroll bar, right? We'd have a scroll bar if this was many other countries, right? We would be able to scroll up and down as I highlight my rows, right? Um, or as I scroll over, mouse over my rows, it highlights them kind of nicely, right? Um, one caution about this is that it's nice to look at my data this way, right? It's nice to print the data frames this way um, because it's it's kind of formatted nicely, right? And it makes it easier to read. It makes it easier to kind of find an individual value. However, what Jupyter Notebooks is actually doing here is creating an SVG, scalar or something, scalable vector graphics. I think that's what that's called. Okay, so when you push this to GitHub, it will show up as a broken image, right? Because GitHub will not do SVGs, okay? If you do it this way, this is just raw text and GitHub will be fine, okay? So that's just a slight aside um, that, you know, it's nice to look at this when you're actually running the notebook. If you're committing something to GitHub, um, it's sometimes better to use print. The formatting. Yeah, exactly. So just using data versus print, right? Um, what print is actually doing is it's taking the values of that are in this data frame and it's pushing them through the print function and actually turning them into um, turning them into uh, strings. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of additional information we could find. Right, we could use the data frame. So we could just say data.info. And it would tell us all about the data types. Right. Um, so one thing there, right, is that this data has a bunch of methods. This is a, a feature of object oriented programming associated with this data type data this data frame is a whole bunch of methods one of them is called info which presumably just spits out some metadata some characteristics of my data frame okay a hint is that you can see what all of these methods are if you hit dot or period and you hit tab might be tab, tab, there we go. You might have to wait a second, right? So there are all of these different kinds of methods that are associated with this pandas data frame. And we're going to be using quite a bit of these, right? So we're going to do next Tuesday, when we get into some actual data analysis with Python, some analysis of time series, we're going to use an awesome, amazing friend here called group by to do some pretty dramatic stuff that would ordinarily require or require us to use like a bunch of for loops. Okay. Um, so, but sometimes uh, we'll, um, sometimes you're kind of not sure what methods are available to you, what functions are available to you with this data frame. Um, so any, any pandas in particular, but any data type in particular that is some sort of structure, some sort of data structure like this, right? Whether it is this data frame, when we get into uh, X array, it'll be a data set. Um, it, it could be um, a time series and some other, um, some of our plots, right? It will return us some kind of object like this. We can sort of explore what we can do, the functions that work by just kind of hitting tab, right? And seeing what methods, what functions are available to us, okay? So some of these, right, are colored. The, the ones in F are functions. Um, the ones, um, that are eyes, our instance, or I think of this more as info, right? So if I if I type a t t r s, those are the attributes, and 
this data frame doesn't have any attributes because I haven't provided any to it. Right, but there's a whole bunch of information. There's a whole bunch of metadata that goes along with these with these data frames. Okay. Okay. So, what else can we do? Another another important thing that we can do is um, for the geoscientists in us, right? How many of you, when you first looked at this table, thought that it was kind of formatted a bit wonky? Yeah, right. Like it's a little bit weird that uh, it's a little bit weird that we have our time series across the columns, right? We'd more expect it like Australia and New Zealand to be the columns and the GDP to be in the rows. Well, we can transpose not only the data inside, but the whole data frame itself, right? So I can, I'm going to do this slightly different then um, I'm going to do this slightly differently than is done in the lesson. And I'm actually going to say DF2 for data frame two, frequently instead of calling it data, that's a little bit generic. We'll refer to these data frames explicitly using DF, right? DF for data frame. So let's say data frame two equals data dot transpose. And I'll just um, write out to my screen what data frame two looks like, right? So now um, it's completely just transposed the whole da data frame, right? So that's kind of nicer. It's, it's, more, it's more readable for one, right? But for another, um, it's also, right, it's got, more canonically what I would think of as a time series, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So all we had to do is use dot T for transpose. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll let you use, um, go through this, uh, the rest of this on your own. This is just kind of um, giving us a few of these kind of different, um, a few of these kind of different ways we can learn some information about our data frame, right? So some of this is kind of like just FYI, right? How can we kind of drill into and and learn some information about our data frame? Okay. But where I want to get into today for the last fifteen minutes is more about kind of analyzing this data set, okay? Okay, so let's move on to this plotting portion. Okay, and let's see. Um, we're now going to start using, so the best thing to do would actually be to just create another notebook um, and start, start kind of cleanly. But we're going to introduce another uh, another library that we're going to be using. So, so most of the times when we're writing Python programs, when we're writing notebooks, we're going to be using multiple libraries, right? Um, each one of these libraries is good at kind of a small and individual set of things. So NumPy is good for numerical things, right? So NumPy has inside of it things to do things like create vectors, to multiply vectors and matrices, to create tensors, to um, even some of our matrix operations like Cholesky factorizations or singular value decomposition. So NumPy has kind of that linear algebra kind of stuff inside of it. Pandas, right? Pandas has kind of those data framing things, right? So the kinds of things that we would want to do with a spreadsheet or with a time series, right? It has things like group by that's going to say, I have a bunch of daily data. I want you to group that by year and I want to do some kind of operation on the year. What's cool about Python and about um, these libraries is that they, they work in conjunction with one another. Right, so I can start to do really powerful things like 
uh, let's group my daily data by year. And then I want to use NumPy's, uh, um, I want to fit a wavelet transform to each individual year. Okay, um, so we're going to start chaining together different parts of these libraries to start doing some fairly sophisticated data analysis and workflowy types of things. This one is a little bit more straightforward, right? And all it involves is I want to read in some data and I want to start plotting that data, right? That's a, a very common thing that we would first do. I want to read in my discharge and I want to plot it before I do anything else. I want to get a sense of like, one, are there big data gaps? Two, what is kind of the range of magnitude of my data? Three, kind of what is the temporal extent or the X, Y and extent of my data? And that's what we're going to do here. So the new library that we're going to introduce is called matplotlib. And matplotlib, you're going to use again and again and again. Um, and the way that we import it is we're going to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Okay. We're also going to import pandas, import pandas as pd. And before I run it, I want to stop to kind of ask something, right? So if we've developed this mental model of these libraries as toolboxes, and um, I'm doing an import here, import matplotlib.pyplot. And we just talked about, right, these data structures and how this dot, this period sort of signifies some relationship between what comes before the dot and what comes after the dot. How can we extend that mental model to think about pyplot and its relationship to our broader toolbox, matplotlib? Jerry. Exactly. Yep, so that's a great analogy, right? This is like a, an individual drawer within a tool, toolbox. So you can think of matplotlib as this kind of like massive toolbox, right? And pyplot is just kind of one relatively big drawer within that toolbox that we're gonna use, right? So why open the whole toolbox if we only need to use a little sub subset of it? Okay, so that's, Often pyplot is kind of what we're going to be using, okay? Okay, so go ahead and import those. Um, if you're using your own special environment, you're just gonna have to make sure that matplotlib is installed. Okay, and then we're gonna skip down here. We don't need to make this kind of one individual plot. Um, we're going to, um, let's see. Let's actually, so let's do this. Let's, instead of Oceania, who wants to pick a continent? Uh, I don't think there's any GDP in Antarctica. That's part of Oceania. Africa. Africa, you want, okay, let's let's pick Africa. Okay, so let's load this data, right? So this is gonna look like PD dot read underscore CSV. And let's uh, tab complete. Well, I can, so we'll read in Africa. Uh, let's do, Index call, right? So we want to index by country. Okay, and then let's uh, let's go ahead and just read that in and make sure that we read it in, okay? Okay. So again, right, it's um it's oriented the same way as the Oceana one was, right? So we have actually like our time series 
across the columns in our countries through the rows. Okay, so again, this is not necessarily, this isn't the way, I would not have written these columns and rows the same way. How many of you agree with that statement? If you were actually creating this spreadsheet? Yeah, so th there's some cleaning or wrangling that we need to do before we're maybe ready to, to plot this data and do something, um, you know, look at this as a time series. So what are the kinds of things that we might want to do? Like, what would you do to this spreadsheet, this data frame, to make it more amenable to do some kind of data analysis? We, we would transpose the data frame, right? So that the X, right? So through the rows is our time, right? What else would you do? Any comments on these column headings? Yeah, to to what? Just the year. Just the year, yeah. Like we would want to get, like I get it. These are all GDP per capita. Like you don't need to tell me that, right? Um, so, so we would need to do that, right? But how do we? How do we do that? Are there some relatively straightforward tools that we can do those just quickly without having to go into the actual spreadsheet and and delete all of the like GDP per cap, right? Or do something wonky in Excel like mid and I don't remember what it is. Okay. The answer is yes, right? So let's go ahead and do this. Let's do um uh all right, so let's do, let's look at this command here. So we'll say that uh, years is equal to data dot columns dot str dot strip. And I want to strip off GDP per cap underscore close quotes, close parens. And I'll type years here so it prints out. That would be DF, yeah. Don't Sorry, yep, yeah, DF, thank you. All right. Okay. Well, this is pretty cool. Right. So what happened here? I said, okay, data frame again, I use these periods just to chain on additional things I could do. This is this is kind of um, again, this is a feature of object-oriented programming. Um, but this is um my older MATLAB-based self and my C-based self, this was not something that we did. Right. We would have to do something with a for loop and str compare or something like that, right? Um, so what we did is we said, okay, give me the data frame and give me the columns and then convert those columns to string and strip off the part that matches GDP per cap underscore, okay? And so it returns, so if I look at this, when I printed years, it gives me index 1952, 1957. Okay, so that's a start, but what kind of, what kind of variable is years at the moment? It says D type equals object. And each one of these is enclosed in a single quote. Yeah, so this is a string. So it's a start, but it's not quite, there, right? It's not quite where I want it to be. Okay. So what I need to do now is I'm now going to say, I'm going to, to write over, I'm going to overwrite my column names and I'm going to say df dot columns equals years dot as type open parentheses int. 
Okay, and I'll go ahead and print out DF again. Okay. All right, so what did we do? We said, okay, data frame dot columns, right? Was this equal sign an equal sign of, um, again, this is where the mathematicians and the folks that are our programmers would, can't stand the way that Python formats things. Am, am, I, am I asking the question if df dot columns is equal to years, or am I saying that as an equality? What am I actually doing? Yeah, Angela. Yes, so this equal sign is an equal sign of assignment, right? I am assigning df dot columns to not only years, but years as type, I am coercing years. This is called coercion. I'm coercing years to be type integer, okay? And I'm overwriting it, okay? So now that GDP per cap, when I print it out DF this time, okay? Um, and if I compare that to up here, when I printed out DF, this GDP per cap is gone, right? So here's a question for you. If I reran this again, if I just took this and copied it again, what would the result be? Or what are some plausible impacts of this? I actually don't know the answer. We'll just do it and see. Why might it say error? There's no GDP cap anymore per cap, right? Okay, so that's one potential thing is it's gonna say, I don't, there's no GDP per cap to strip. What's another potential error? It could be nothing, right? It could say, okay, I stripped it. There, it wasn't there, but right. Okay, what's another one that's associated with this? Are my columns strings anymore? Yeah. No, they're integers. I might get a type error, right? It might say, I can't, I don't know what you're trying to get me to do here. And then moreover, if it was successful, right? It would overwrite that years that I had above, right? So if I went back above and tried to rerun this, I might get some other weird error. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a great question, right? And so the answer is that um, uh, the answer is sort of getting very close to what you're talking about, right? Which is this idea that. Um, that uh, a Jupyter notebook, although very helpful, right? If we went back up and just reran this, if we reran this cell, well, if we reran this cell, it would re-import the data for us, right? But if we had done anything here that depended on DF being oriented in this particular way, like if we had transposed it, it would transpose it again. Right, so we could get out of order. Okay. Okay. All right. So now we've re-indexed our columns. The last thing I want to do before we uh, before we leave for the day is I want to generate a plot. Okay. I want to generate a plot for a particular country um, of GDP per time. Okay. So pick pick a country for me. Swaziland, okay. All right, so let's print the GDP for Swaziland. And what I'm gonna do is say DF uh, square bracket, left square bracket, Swazi, and I don't know how to spell Swaziland, so I'm gonna type S-W-A 
actually it's capital. This will be case sensitive, SWA. Z. Okay. I thought it might tab complete. Yeah, it might not. Okay. Oh, I have to do loc. DF dot loc for locate. So locate Swaziland in my data frame and plot it. Just plot. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So that was actually like a pretty, like, you know, I would not put this plot in a presentation or my thesis, right? But that was a, a pretty cool, like little quick plot, right? I mean, I was able to, these, you know, there's not labels, but I can broadly interpret this, right? Um, I can make a, a broad statement that between about 1952 and 2007, the GDP per capita of Swaziland increased by about four and a half fold. All right. So for those quick kind of insights on my data set, these kinds of plots are great. And you can actually go back and add labels to that plot, right? We can start pushing arguments to plot to make labels on it. Okay. Okay. We're past time. What I'd like you to do is um, go ahead and um, before next Tuesday, um, Go through the rest of this lesson, which is just on using uh, Pandas and Matplotlib together. And then when we come back on next Tuesday, we're actually going to start doing some slightly more sophisticated analysis on some discharge data. Okay. Any questions before leaving?